one. It's like, why does it always have to be three scratches? And I have had people on my team that have been scratched, and you know, it doesn't have to be a demon. I totally believe what you're saying, Jason, that maybe it's just, you know, trying to reach out and touch someone. It's not always in a nice way. Maybe it wasn't even intentionally meant to be in a bad way. You know what I mean? I agree. It just I agree. Really happens, it could happen that and, way. And this is my whole theory on it. I mean, first of all, when it comes to three scratches, typically whenever you scratch anybody, living or not living, you're always going to wind up with three scratches. Why? Because there's three fingers that wind up touching the skin. The other two are just short little stumps. Bottom line, you have your thumb and your pinky. That's true. So, so the other three fingers are always going to be in the, the, the you know, whatever. That's, that's the one that's mainly going to touch. Secondly, when it comes to three, everybody, everybody uses, you know, that whole three transformation. Whenever you knock on someone's door, you can count them. And every single time, it's going to be three knocks. And you say, hello, anyone there? Every time. So why would that change after you die? It's not going to. Sure. And secondly, sure. I don't think it's a scratch that a ghost is doing. I think it's more of an energy, the energy touching you. Kind of like take a bare wire and rub it up next to your skin. I guarantee you, you're going to have a scratch like Mark's hair. It's that simple. I mean, if we're investigating and researching energy, why, why would it change? Because, you know, it, you know, someone's dead or whatever. You know what I mean? I don't think it would change. I think it's the energy in the spirit that's actually making marks on it. I don't think it's an intentional scratch. No, I hadn't actually I hadn't actually considered the bare wire comparison, but that actually makes perfect sense. Yeah, uh, I've had one experience of being scratched one time. It was, um, and uh, the, the way it felt, and what was cool about this is Barry had a thermal camera camera on me, and this is when we were filming the show, and I had two other camera guys with the camera on me. So you could literally see my hands didn't go nowhere. There wasn't anybody around me. And all of a sudden, my neck just starts to glow because the heat that's coming from, you know, the the, the scratch or uh, yeah. oh, the wow. burn or whatever you want to call it. So I went over there, and sure enough, you know, it went from the bottom of, under my earlobe all the way underneath my collar, and it was bleeding. It was actually bleeding. Oh. So Barry took a cotton swab. We had a wow. Q-tip, and he swabbed it, put it in a baggie, and we were go- we were trying to find someone to do a DNA test on it. Oh wow! See, you know, was there some sort of foreign DNA uh, on this? But there was, you know, no no police department's going to do that. It costs a lot of money. Um, it just whatever. It just never happened. But it was a cool idea. Yeah, that would have been kind of cool to find out w- what exactly happened. I think now um, they're working on you know tests that you can buy right at um, you know Walmart or any drugstore that uh, you can test your DNA in. So I mean. If that ever happens again, I think we should look forward to, to picking up some of those little things just to see what we would find. Hmm. I know Ancestry.com has DNA kits that they send out, but I don't know if that would be the right type of kit to do that. As long as it will test the DNA. Yeah. Yeah. Would be an interesting experiment, though. Yeah, next yeah. time somebody gets scratched in here, you always have some Q-tips. Yeah. Uh-huh. Rub that scratch and see what you get. I always well, I have always, tips. <laughs> I, I may not have few tips, but I always have toilet paper with me somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that'll work the same. <laughs> uh, we'll just have to pack you a makeup bag, Jason. I always got Q tips. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, you're a chick. You're the diva. Oh, you gotta have a makeup bag. Of course. She's the one going in with a KQ meter voice recorder, thermal engine camera, and. A bag of Mary Kay products. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So why are you putting that makeup on during investigation? I'm not. I'm trying to see if something's walking up behind me. <laughs> <laughs> she's got the mirror out, you know. She's looking in. No one's coming behind me. Let me just finish yeah, up this eye case, real quick. <laughs> that's, that's, in case, you know, that's in case I need to see behind me with the mirror or, you know, mark someplace with that, mark it, you know, put an X with that lipstick. You never know when that makeup kit's going to come in handy. <laughs> there could That's be a hot good. guy. There could be a hot guy at that investigation. I might need to look pretty for. Who knows? That's kind of weird. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. So, tell me, Brad. Before uh, before you even signed on to Ghost Lab, what, what kind of work have you done? Um, I'm sure you had a, a private team. Even if you may even still have that team now, who knows? Oh, yeah. I still have a team. Um, 
that I, you mentioned how long you've been doing it. When you look at it, I haven't been active. I've I've been actively field investigating since about 2007. Yeah. Um, prior to that, ever since 1990, I've been doing a lot of research, you know, just book research, because um, that's obviously before the Internet came out, so books and magazines yeah. and things was the only yeah. thing you had to go by, publications. Um, and then, uh, you know, once the Internet came out, I started doing all that, uh, you know, talking with people, listening to experiences, just kind of mentally documenting you know, the, the things that, you know, my ideas and what could cause this. And then, you know, ironically, the, the TV show Ghost Hunters came out about 2005, I think. Yeah. And I yeah. watched it, and I was like, yeah, because I used to love the, the like, uh, That's Incredible and, and Unsolved Mysteries and those kind of shows that had those segments on it. That, those are my favorite parts to, to watch. And because uh, that was all they had on TV back then was if they had a sec on, on a news uh, station or a special feature or something. But now they had this ghost hunting show, and I was watching it, and I frankly I was a little disappointed. And I was like, I just don't think that it's being done right. Um, you know, not not that I'm passing judgment on other people and how they operate because they each his own. I was just trying to think, you know, if if, if you're if you're really out to get it, you got to experiment. You got to you got to theorize. You have to. You can't just walk in. In the beginning of that show, it was they're trying just to debunk everything. And then as the show went on, everything was paranormal. So it's like, you know, where do you stand? And and that's where I said, you know, when we we started uh, 2007, I said I'm going to form a team. I'm going to do this the way I feel, the way it should be done. And that's what we did. Is, is we went out. We 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 got busy quick. I mean, we were investigating probably two or three times a week. It was getting crazy, um, and um, we we got a lot of good evidence. A lot of things that formulated our theories that you saw on Ghost Lab. We got that prior to Ghost Lab. Um, we just used the budget that Discovery Channel had to to do it on a grand scale, and uh, if, if nothing else, that was the most valuable thing. Uh, from being on television was the fact that that we had a budget that we could use to do certain things that other teams could only dream of, and that was that was very invaluable. Sure, sure. Now I know that um, well. Networks are all a bunch of idiots and so forth and so on. And did did you take advantage of these places that you went to? Did I take advantage? What do you mean? Um. You know, be, be able to, to, to research them on a more personal level and, and, and gather everything that you could possibly want to help, you know, solidify your own personal interest. Are you talking about, you mean like all of our places prior to Ghost Lab? Yeah, while you're on Ghost Lab, you know, while they're sending you to all these places and they're doing the filming. I, I know it's kind of hard to try to do what you have to do, that you want to do, you know, when you have a phone crew there and, and you know, oh, it's easy. Do that, it, do that. It, 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 we. When we set out, what was funny is is our first location, our first episode, the first place we filmed was was ironically in Shreveport, Jody, the Shreveport Municipal Auditorium. Oh, and wow. we showed up there. We never met this camera. So this, all this production crew shows up, these camera guys, these audio guys, these directors and producers, and we're all sitting in this hotel lobby, and they're kind of on one side and we're on the other, and we're having this pizza, little pizza dinner. And I walk over there, and I just start shooting the breeze with these guys, and they were shocked. And I'm like, what is shocked? You know, what's, what's the big deal? They're like, oh, usually we're not supposed to talk to the talent. They, they referred to us as the talent. And I said, oh, wow. I said, guys, I put my pants on one leg at a time just like anyone else around here. And I said, I'll tell you what, if you're going to be on the road with us and you're going to be in these investigations with us, guess what? You are now a paranormal investigator. You're not a, you're not a camera crew. You are paranormal investigators helping us with, and and that's what we did is we yeah. used their cameras as different angles that we didn't have. We used them as spotters. We used them as you know whatever that we could use them as. And a lot of times we got some really really great evidence. And the only reason that it was validated was because we had we had these camera guys with different angles that could actually show you know, like a shadow moving that wasn't supposed to be there or something yeah. like that. And they hated the, the producers and the upper, you know, brass at Discovery. 
they have this thing they call the fourth wall. They never want to break the, what they call the fourth wall in television shows. In other words, they want the viewer to think that you're the only one there. They don't want the viewers to realize that there's a camera crew there, which if you're that stupid to realize that, you know, we just don't film ourselves. Right. Well, there's a whole crew of people there. Out there that, that are that stupid. I'm not going to lie, Brad. They are. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, honestly, there's people who, are, who would send us emails saying, you know, how can you get that much evidence in just 30 minutes? It's like, <laughs> you realize that 30 minutes was three days of 18-hour days trying to get that crap. Of course, of course. Yeah. But, um, no, we, we and, and they hated that. And I insisted on a couple of occasions, I said, the only way that this really comes across as badass is if that camera guy gets on camera and we do an interview with him and he says, you know, based on his personal opinion, this kind of thing just doesn't happen. Because these guys aren't ghost guys. They're just normal guys. They they don't do the ghost thing. And for them to say that was that was weird, you know, that that's that's gold. And uh, I convinced them a few times to do that because there's no other way around it. Um, we, we were like, we were like a, a, you know, a family really. Um, they got to know us. We got to know them. We would literally just kind of walk in a room. They'd know what we were thinking and they'd move and they wouldn't be in our way. And for the entire time, you know, it's like we would be doing these investigations as if nobody was there because these guys really knew how to get out of our way. And it was a very, very good, um, production crew slash talent. I'm using that use that word loosely, um, relationship. That's great, though. And, I mean, a lot of those camera guys are just not used to anybody being that friendly and that cool to them. They're really not. No, they said they said a lot of, a lot of, a lot of people on TV are dicks. <laughs> and, uh, and, I, and I believe it because, I mean, even in the paranormal, there's, there's some people that I know, I'm not going to name names, there's people I know that are just, there's some dicks and there's some bitches out there, let me tell you. And it's like, guys, you're on a reality show, show on cable TV. Get over yourself. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I agree. And then there's some, some crazy fans out there that do take everything they see 100% seriously. It, it's funny. It, it's funny to watch sometimes. Well, yeah, I mean, when, when – I don't know, and then – and then you see that you see different paranormal teams out there aligning themselves with certain TV shows. Like, I only oh, do yeah. this because I saw so and so do it. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing. It's, it's kind of funny because I don't sound like a critical because I don't care if people emulate what we do. But at the same time, we're just experimenting. You know, we're not we're not doing something a specific way. If you wanted to use that as a model to help you with your experiments, and then you build on it, hey, that's fine. But just because if there's high EMF, high EMF in an area, that means that the person is hallucinating. That's BS. That's total BS. That EMF is what well, is causing that paranormal activity because it's feeding the energy. You know, and there's so many studies out there, so many scientific studies that show that, that show the World Health Organization says less than 1% of the people in the world are EMF hypersensitive. So why is it that every time there's high EMF, everyone says, oh, they're EMF hypersensitive. They're hallucinating these things, and they leave. It's, it's doing the, the it's doing the field an injustice. I agree. I agree. I, I can share with you another kind of funny story that you may laugh at. Actually, um, and not, uh, a while ago, I, I was on a deserted island with a group of people, and and during my time at this deserted island, needless to say, we got dropped off. And once we got dropped off, the guy, captain guy, left, and that was it. We were there. And that was it. So during the time after we got dropped off, well, obviously we took our bags to our, our little rooms and, um, you know, did what we had to do. And we were the only one inhabiting this, this whole island to ourselves in the building. Now, after we unpacked, we all sat down and decided, well, we need to make some lunch because now it's around 1 or 2 o'clock. Now, during lunch, one of the guys stood up and said, when are we going to start our lockdown? I looked around and I said, dude, we're on a deserted island. How much more locked down can you get? You know what I mean? Right. <laughs> Nobody's coming. Right. That's it. <laughs> we're about as locked as locked can go. So, yeah, or they, or they wait till, or they wait till 3 a.m. because that's the, the, the witching hour or, or whatever, dead time or oh whatever. Oh, my God. 
Yeah, right. <laughs> it's like 3 a.m. A lot of times I'm already back in bed. You know, screw that. Um, those late night things. 